Well, thanks very much for that introduction, uh, Pete, and thanks also to uh, Sarah and Patrick for the invitation uh, to come today. Um, it's a real privilege to be speaking at this center in particular. Um, before I knew that I would ever speak here, I had already been following uh, virtually uh, many of the recorded lectures uh, of this center, and I was very familiar with the sociology department uh, the work of Eric Wright and others, others of making um, the University of Wisconsin-Madison a kind of uh, unusual center of where it's possible to pursue uh, <coughs> radical critical theory uh, in a way that is increasingly difficult to do in this country uh, and in, in, in most parts uh, of, of the Western world, in fact, in, in higher education. So that preserving these kinds of centers is a real is a real strength and it's a privilege to, to be here. It's also a privilege to speak uh, the day after uh, uh, Tarek Ali, um, uh, who spoke yesterday, um, and the presentation tomorrow on social movements uh, will uh, explicitly engage some of the past speakers at this, at this center, including the work of uh, David McNally and Joshua Clover, both of whom were visiting scholars in the last two years or so. <coughs> So today what I want to do though is to take up a few themes of my latest book, The Last Day of Oppression and the First Day of the Same, The Politics and Economics of the New Latin American Left, and also to speak to a few themes of a small book that I'm presently working on with Frank Goudichaud from the University of Grenoble and uh, Massimo Modenesi from the National Autonomous University of Mexico which is Assessing the Pink Tide in Latin America, Economic Strategy and Social Theory. So uh, this, these two books kind of bridge similar topics. The, the latter is kind of an update uh, in different ways. But I'm going to begin with the title of the last book, The Last Day of Oppression and the First Day of the Same. This title has to do, or I borrow from uh, a slogan that, that emerged in early Republican Ecuador after independence was declared from uh, from Spain, and what the slogan referred to was the way in which Ecuador's independence was not accompanied in the early 19th century by a social revolution, but merely a political revolution that established uh, independence from, from Spain, but in which the ruling class, the white mestizo ruling class, continued to rule in a similar way as they had under colonial times and with those beneath them uh, continuing to live under uh, racial and class oppression as they had during the colonial period. And therefore, the hope of independence for those radical lower orders who had struggled for independence in Ecuador and who quickly realized that actual independence in the early 19th century had not achieved what they had hoped it would, started to proliferate graffiti across the walls of the capital city of Quito in the early 19th century, which said the last day of despotism and the first day of the same, meaning not much had changed since independence uh, from Spain. This expression, I think, if in a novel form, captures something essential about the first decade and a half or so of this century in Latin America. And indeed, many on the left who had uh, optimistically looked at the turn to the left in Latin America in the early part of this century had declared, in fact, this movement a movement of Latin America's second independence. And by that they meant, optimistically, two things. That this second independence would promise a liberation from the dominance of neoliberalism, which was dominating internationally, and which seemed to be being turned, uh, turned aside in, in Latin America as an anomaly in the world system, and secondarily, a achievement of a relative autonomy from U.S. domination through the establishment of various regional bodies uh, which excluded the United States, which we can get into uh, later on in the Q&A. But that's what they meant by the Latin American second independence. But what I want to suggest today, unfortunately, is something less optimistic, which is to say that the resonance of the Ecuadorian slogan of the early 19th century has a deeper resonance uh, with the Latin American second independence slogan and not in the way intended by those who suggested this was Latin America's second independence. That is to say, the hopes 
that were established in the extra-parliamentary struggles of the early 21st century and the establishment of center-left and left governments for a transformation, at least, of neoliberalism, and for some uh, with anti-capitalist aspirations, uh, have in many ways been dogged by continuities, structural continuities, in social property relations, in relations with imperialism, and in relations with the world system and the international division of labor, more than has been uh, the case of, of transformation. So continuity uh, is really the dominant, uh, the dominant feature. So what my book, The Last Day of Repression, tries to do essentially <coughs> is to analyze the political and economic dynamics of the Latin American left from the early 1990s until uh, more or less today. I covered in the book until 2016. And the left here is understood in the broadest sense across all of its social movement, party, and regime modalities. So this is not merely a study of left-wing political parties once they have assumed governmental office and are carrying out a series of policies, which is, uh, in my view, uh, unfortunately, the dominant way of looking at the Latin American left in this period. <coughs> this instead looks at, it does look at regime modalities, but it also looks at uh, social movement and party modalities even when they haven't achieved office. And there can be situations in which the social movement left, the power of the extra-parliamentary left is quite strong, but they do not have political articulation. And there are other cases in which there is political articulation, but no social and independent class struggle from below, and therefore that political articulation in office um, has less strength than it otherwise would. So seeing it in these, in all of its modalities, I think we get a better sense of the rhythms of the left in the region over these periods. And what I tried to do in, uh, in characterizing the left over, this, over these periods since 1990 is to balance carefully or to assess carefully the shifting balance of power between uh, three different clusters. On the one side, the, uh, the, the ability, ideologically, socially, economically, and sometimes militarily, of the rural and urban popular classes and oppressed groups to express their self-interest, to organize uh, and, uh, and express their capacities politically and so on. So they're changing capacities, rural and urban popular classes and oppressed groups. A second group, the domestic ruling classes, the extent to which they are able to c cohere in a, re in, a, in a ruling bloc that is able to reproduce itself and is able to uh, uh, project its interests over and above the different sectional disputes within the ruling bloc. And thirdly, the cluster of power of imperialism, which is overwhelmingly U.S. imperialism, but not reducible to U.S. imperialism, as there are other imperialisms operating um, in the region. So these three different clusters of power and their ability and strength in ideological, economic, sociological terms shifts quite dramatically across different periods from 1990, uh, and in no way can we treat these as, as static entities. And in particular, the, the dynamics of imperialism are often thought of uh, in a static way, as if U.S. projection of power is unchanging over this entire period um, and can be treated as such. So there's two principal purposes of the talk today. The first is to trace what are three theoretical currents uh, running through the book. And the second is to offer a historical and conceptual periodization of the left using these theoretical threads uh, from, the from 1990 until the present. Now the first theoretical engagement has to do with the literature on inequality and the literature on inequality in relationship to class and other forms of social oppression in contemporary Latin America. Now, the rise of the left in Latin America rejuvenated in mainstream social scientific discussion, uh, discussion over, over problems of inequality in the region. For those of you who, who follow Latin America at all, you will understand that for many centuries, in fact, Latin America has been the most unequal region in the world, not the most impoverished, but the most unequal. And this has persisted, but uh, anomalously, during the early part of this century, Latin America was one of the only regions in the world in which there was a short-lived but real trajectory 
uh, in the other direction. As, as the rest of the world became more unequal, Latin America was becoming relatively less unequal, at least if you look at income inequality, uh, it becomes much more complicated if you think of wealth inequality, which is m more difficult to measure, but this was what was spurring these debates in mainstream, in mainstream uh, social scientific circles. And of course, this found an international expression in debates around inequality after the beginning of the 2008 global crisis with the success of Thomas Piketty, uh, his book on capital and everything else, those neo-Keynesian debates in economics. So I engage theoretically with these debates to suggest that while this renewed interest in inequality is, is something to celebrate, the way it's been debated in the Anglophone literature in Latin America has been uh, problematic in terms of the thin conceptualizations of both class uh, and capitalism, their dynamics, and in terms of the relationship between capitalism and class and other forms of social oppression, gender, sexuality, race, nation, and how we should think of these things together. Fundamentally, what you see when you look at this literature in sociology is the dominance, either implicit or explicit, of Weberian historical sociology, the idea of Weberian conceptions of class, static conceptions rooted in income and status, uh, which are not very helpful in terms of understanding exploitation, uh, nor, in, nor in terms of understanding historical conflict or process of class. In economics, this is dominated by neostructuralism in Latin America, which is a Latin American variation of the international trend of neo-institutional neo economics, but in Latin America, neostructuralism is attached to the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. And this is the dominant way of understanding inequality in which effectively all you need is renewed state intervention to regulate the capitalist market and the principal engine of dynamism in the economy ought to, ought to still be the market, albeit in a, in a uh, regulated relationship with the state. Um, and in terms of political science, even on the left of Anglophone literature on Latin America, this is dominated implicitly or explicitly from liberal conceptions of democracy. That is to say, an overemphasis on institutions, electoral processes, uh, constitutional uh, uh, separation of powers, and so on, rather than deeper conceptions of democracy that were being uh, organically produced over this period uh, from the outset. So all of these, I think, really miss uh, the entirety of what was unique, despite the deep contradictions of what was of the intellectual debates coming out of Latin America itself. So what I tried to do is introduce a different schema to uh, understand inequality, and the stress here is on the totalizing power of capital and a processual and relational conceptualization, conceptualization of class relations and other internally related social oppressions gender, sexuality, race, and nation, as they play out in contemporary Latin American capitalism. So if class is understood as a living relational phenomenon, then it is necessarily conceived as also being multiply determined in and through gender, race, and sexuality in the present Latin American scenario. And from this, from this vantage point, the latter social oppressions are not dismissed as mere epiphenomena of the class structure, nor are they reduced to symptoms of class exploitation. Yet the way in which these multiple forms of social oppression constitute capitalist society alongside class can only be fully comprehended when they are conceptualized as being internally related to class. Class, gender, and race are then a dialectical unity of multiple determinations rather than a series of separate parallel tracks that only come together randomly and at different periods. So famously, uh, the case of El Alto in Bolivia, where, where I worked with uh, indigenous proletarians make up roughly 90% of that city. If you're an indigenous proletarian woman in El Alto today, you're not indigenous on Monday, a proletarian on Tuesday, and something else on Wednesday, but the concrete historical, concrete conceptualization of these dynamics of multiple oppression are lived experiences simultaneously uh, in your in your consciousness and in, your, in the structural relationship to uh, your workplace and your community. So these are discrete phenomena, but only comprehensible when shown to be in interrelation with one another in concrete, historically specific settings. 
So the way I do this in the book is to think about five interconnected but mutually constitutive moments of class relations in contemporary Latin American capitalism, starting with the sphere of production, the workplace, where surplus value is generated by workers uh, and extracted by capital, within the sphere of exchange, the labor market, where workers' labor power is institutionally organized so that it can be sold to capital for its subsequent exploitation in the workplace, and where workers' wages constitute effective demand for capital's products. Within the private sphere, the family, where mostly women's unpaid labor contributes to the generational reproduction of the labor force, so the private unpaid labor of social reproduction, but also, the, to a certain degree, the public unpaid labor which is of social reproduction, which is also gendered insofar as education and healthcare have been socialized. These are still overwhelmingly uh, female occupations uh, in the sphere of social reproduction, even if they're paid in the context of Latin America. The fourth prism is through race and racism, which facilitates the generation of categories of worker for particular occupations, reproduces cultural distinctions and divisions among laboring classes, and justifies unequal economic rewards. And finally, in capitalist society's interface with its substratum, nature, where the latter, nature, is commodified and used by capital as an input into production and as a dumping ground for waste production. And this interface or substratum of nature uh, under which capitalism operates is especially important in the contemporary context of the Latin American left around the debates about the acceleration of extractive <laughs> capitalism, the acceleration of uh, uh, open pit mining, of natural gas and oil extraction, and of agro-industrial uh, capitally intensive uh, farming methods, which are accelerating across the region, whether under left or under right governments. So this is the first line of theoretical inquiry. The second line, which is related, is a restoration, an attempt to restore in a Latin American idiom, the romantic Marxist tradition as against economistic evolutionary linear, linear conceptions uh, of Marxism. This is the romantic tradition of Marxism which offers a total critique of bourgeois civilization by drawing selectively from the pre-capitalist past and combining this dialectically with emancipatory visions of a post-capitalist future. So this is not the conservative nostalgia for pre-capitalism, but a selective recovery, for example, of indigenous traditions, not in the idea of, a, uh, of, a, of an impossible return, but the selective recovery of certain traditions in order to fuel a post-capitalist vision of transformation into the future. And my inclination to return to romantic threads in the Marxist tradition is in response precisely to the opposite dominant orthodoxy in contemporary Latin American Marxism, represented by figures such as the Bolivian Vice President Alvaro <coughs> Garcilinera, who defend as progressive and using a Marxist stadium, defend as progressive and necessary the extension of large-scale mining, natural gas and oil extraction, and agro-industrial monocropping in alliance with multinational capital, in which this multinational capital is now called boss, or partners rather than bosses in the new idiom of these uh, governments and in which left and indigenous critics of this latest iteration of extractive capitalism in Latin America are condemned as naive romantics, or worse, the useful idiots of imperialism. A return to romantic Marxism can help us to understand left and indigenous critics of extractive capitalism as left critics contesting, uh, contesting the, uh, the official Marxism proposed by uh, state managers of these, of these new left in the Andes. And in the Latin American scenario in particular, I argue that we should return especially to the work of the early 20th, 20th, 20th century Peruvian Marxist Jose Carlos Mariategui, and the argument here is that there is a utopian revolutionary dialectic of pre-capitalist past and socialist future running through Mariategui's core works. And here in particular, Mariategui's attempt to recover the IUs of the, uh, of the Andean Plateau in, in Peru, in a similar way to the late Marx in his reflections on the peasant commune in Russia, that is to say, not as a stage to, to be overcome 
on the progressive evolutionary uh, momentum towards an industrial uh, classless communism in the future, but rather the basis, the partial basis of a socialist future. But those communes, or in Mariatigi's case, those I use, the indigenous, uh, what he calls the living organism of indigenous communities, rather than a folkloric, uh, a folkloric tradition from the past, but the living organism of indigenous communities, distorted by their articulation with capitalism, but still living organisms with uh, communal traditions that can be uh, that can be preserved, those are under threat and will not survive even during Mariatigi's time of the 1920s, 1930s when he's writing. They will only survive through alliances with the urban working classes of Peru, through a socialist revolution in Peru and regionally and in Mariatigi's sense eventually uh, on a world scale. But these indigenous communes, although they can only uh, be, be, be uh, the only way they can endure and, and be preserved is through a, a revolution. They are not something to be overcome in a linear, uh, in a linear progress. Now, what Mariatigi did when he wrote about this was to piss off all the right people in the 1920s and 30s. What he did was uh, invite the condem condemnation of the Comintern, uh, the Latin American Bureau of the Comintern, who, who, uh, who said to him that he had become an indigenous populist romantic, and he alienated the populist nationalists uh, of, of his native Peru, who called him, because of his references to European Marxism, a Eurocentric um, uh, um, internationalist who had, nothing, who had nothing to do with the uh, domestic lands of Peru. And so this idea of Mariatiki's heretical uh, uh, utopian Revolutionary dialectic is, I think, the appropriate kind of heresy for dealing with Alvaro Garcia Linares' alliance with multinational capital in the idea of a succession of, ca of capitalism to communism, which in his words will arrive in 50 to 100 years in the future. Uh, and to recover the traditions of left indigenous disputation of this new Marxist idiom uh, as elements of the left and not as elements of the useful idiots of imperialism. And finally, the third th theoretical thread is a return or an engagement with the latest Gramscian season in Latin America, and in particular in terms of Gramsci's concept of passive revolution and its utility for understanding the dynamics of the left uh, turn in recent decades. Passive revolution here involves an unequal and dialectical combination of restorative and transformative tendencies simultaneously in the same political period. Ultimately, however, it is possible to discern which tendency, restorative or transformative, dominates the character of a given epoch. The transformative dynamics of passive revolution mean that it involves changes in relation to the preceding period, but these changes are, in the end, limited to such a degree that the fundamental underlying relations of domination in society persist even if their political expressions have been altered. Passive revolutions involve <coughs> neither total restoration of the old order nor radical re revolution. Instead, they involve a dialectic, as Gramsci says, of revolution, restoration, transformation, preservation. In the Latin American case, capacities for social mobilization from below in the early stages of the left turn are contained and co-opted or selectively repressed while the political initiative of sections of the dominant classes is restored. This is a molecular process of bureaucratization that Gramsci refers to as transformismo. Passive revolutions involve the establishment of a form of domination capable of enacting conservative reforms masked in the language of the earlier transformative impulses emerging from below, achieving in this way a passive consensus of the dominated classes. So part of my attempt here is to periodize the moments over the last 15 years especially, the moments of restoration, the moments of transformation, and the characterization of the entire epoch as one of principally restoration rather than transformation as the dominant current of this passive revolution. So in the remaining time, 
I'm going to try to show how this has some relevance concretely to five specific phases since the 1990s. These are political and economic phases that overlap intentionally to capture different dynamics. The first phase, 1990 to 2000, is a period of resolute neoliberal hegemony with very, very little effective resistance uh, apart from defensive struggles in Latin America. The second phase, 1998 to 2002, is a period of economic crisis of neoliberalism, which begins then to set off political and sociological crises for neoliberalism's reproduction in the region, which overlaps with this third phase, 1999 to 2003, where you see the slow but sure rearticulation of an extra-parliamentary left long before the parliamentary governmental expressions of the left begin to emerge <coughs> in the mid-2000s. The fourth stage between 2003 and 2011 is characterized by three principal dynamics. One is the restoration of capitalist dynamism in the region after the recession, driven by the commodities boom. This corresponds with the uh, movement from an extra-parliamentary left to an electoral left, dominating elections in South America and parts of Central America, and the establishment of what the Uruguayan political economist Eduardo Godinez calls the compensatory state form. As the new dominant form, the state expression of Gramsci's passive revolution. And fifth and finally, taking us to the present, 2012 until today, this is a period of delayed reverberation of the global crisis, which begins in 2008, but really it begins in earnest in Latin America only in 2012, which corresponds with the end of the political cycle of the, of the left. Uh, but rather than a new hegemony of the right, what you have at the moment is a very unstable impasse in which neither left or right forces are capable of governing or reproducing any secure blocks uh, of rule uh, in the current period. So obviously, I'm going to um, talk about a, a very complex and uneven region without reference very much to specific countries. And in the q and I'm, I'm able to respond to specific questions because obviously these phases don't fit on perfectly, nor are they intended to, uh, the particular dynamics of each social formation. But nonetheless, these regional overviews, I think, are helpful because they show that it was not coincidental that this general pattern is regional and not particular to this or that country uh, and, its, and its particularities. So to begin in 1990, in 1990, you could argue that the Latin American left <coughs> was at its lowest point in, in modern Latin American history. Um, and this has to do with a series of defeats in the preceding decades. Not least the physical military annihilation of huge layers of the left, necessary for the rollout subsequently of neoliberalism through the establishment of bureaucratic authoritarian regimes in the Southern Cone, Argentina, 1976 to 1983, 30,000 people disappeared, targeting peasant associations, urban, urban labor unions, left political parties, human rights organizations, women's organizations, and so on. An entire layer of the organizational cater that would have been the transmission belt for these traditions filtering down to previous generations was literally <coughs> annihilated physically through that, through that authoritarian regime. The same in Pinochet, under Pinochet in Chile, under Brazil's dictatorship, in Uruguay, in Paraguay, in Bolivia, and so on. In Central America, of course, this took uh, the form of Reagan-backed counterinsurgency to defeat the mass guerrilla insurgencies in Guatemala and El Salvador, to defeat the Nicaraguan revolution through the Contras, uh, and in Guatemala in particular, taking on genocidal characteristics with the racialized uh, focus on the Mayan population with over 200,000 dead by the mid-80s. Again, this kind of resolute physical military defeat of the left was absolutely necessary for understanding the subsequent decades of neoliberalism and the impossibility of a easy restoration of left traditions in Latin America. Ideologically, of course, the Soviet Union and its client states had collapsed, and this was fundamentally disorienting 
even for those sections of the Latin American left who never saw in the Soviet Union some kind of ideal to follow, uh, but who nonetheless uh, uh, came to believe that it was impossible uh, to transform uh, this mode of production of capitalism. That is to say, if it was commonsensical in the 1960s Latin American left to believe that the socialist revolution would be possible and necessary in your lifetime, it was virtually unthinkable by the early 1990s that this would, that this would transpire. And what you saw ideolo ideologically then was the shift of center-left and left parties increasingly towards uh, the parameters of neoliberalism such that electoral de debates became how fast to unroll uh, neoliberal packages, how fast to unroll structural adjustment programs, how deep should they be, but no, no contestation of the premise that structural adjustment was necessary to, to, to come out of the debt crisis of the 80s. Uh, Cuba, even the Cuban Revolution, was massively ideologically but also materially <laughs> isolated through uh, the end of, its, uh, of the uh, purchase of its entire sugar exports from the Soviet Union and the continuation of the U.S. embargo. The Nicaraguan Revolution was defeated electorally, obviously on the premise of the Contra's uh, counterinsurgency uh, defeating the Sandinistas militarily before then. So at the early 1990s, it would have been uh, severely delusional, I think, to have predicted that less than 10 years later, Latin America would be the leading edge of anti neoliberal resistance in the world. There were people who predicted this, but there were the people who predicted this under any condition, okay, in which this is always the case. Economically, alongside these political dynamics, there was a fundamental transformation of the class structure and the social base of the left, which is why this kind of broad conception of the left is so important the social characteristics of its base. The urban labor market looked entirely different by the end of the 1990s than it had in the early, uh, in the early 1980s. State restructuring meant that most state-owned enterprises were eliminated. One of the huge elements of that was uh, a massive reduction of the state-employed workforce, so public sector workforces shrunk. The informalization of the urban world of work. Meanwhile, agricultural liberalization trade liberalization in the agricultural sectors was leading to a massive, intensive dispossession of the peasantry and movement into the cities, adding to these informal, uh, uh, highly unemployed or underemployed sectors in, uh, in, in the urban world of Latin America. So any left that was going to come out of this would necessarily look different ideologically, politically, sociologically than it would, have, than it would in its earlier uh, representations. And this was, of course, in terms of imperialism, the, the height of U.S. power, in which the, uh, the successes of the end of the Cold War and the idea of the end of history were established uh, as the common sense of that era. Moving to the second phase between 1998 and 2002, you see the first regional crisis, um, multi-nation regional crisis of neoliberalism, in Latin America. Now, I say the first regional because Mexico had already sunk into crisis in 1993, uh, 94, uh, and earlier in 92. But um, Brazil, Argentina, especially the dominant uh, economies of South America, enter into their worst financial crises uh, of these modern states between 1998 and 2002. And regionally, Again, South America is quite distinct from Central American, Caribbean, and Mexico's dynamics for reasons we'll get into. But in South America in particular, the aggregate GDP of South America was negative for these entire four years. Okay? So what this meant was all of the indicators you want to look at, poverty levels, unemployment levels, um, uh, health indicators, education indicators, and so on, nutritional intake, all of these massively deteriorated in those four years. And they deteriorated from a very low basis point because this was 20 years into neoliberal restructuring. It mattered very much that the governments in power at that time were uh, all center-right or right uh, coalitions who were self-avowedly neoliberal. And so their solution to the crisis was that neoliberalism hadn't gone far enough, 
there was still red tape that was hidden. We need to carry out a third generation of reforms in order to, uh, in order to unleash the, dy the, the dynamism of the market. Now, whereas this had had some ideological appeal in the early 1980s during hyperinflationary crises, in which it is true that uh, a, a large swath of the Latin American population was convinced of the necessity of structural adjustment by the ideological characterization of that period, <coughs> this was very untrue by the 21st century after two decades of experimentation which was seen to have failed. This had no ideological appeal. And in the Latino uh, barometer, for example, uh, the idea that the market was a, was a trusted engine of growth was shared by less than 10% of the Latin American population during this period. A dramatic reversal. So this economic crisis becomes a, uh, a crisis of, uh, of the state, an organic crisis of the state across, across uh, many Latin American countries. And this moves into our third phase of extra-parliamentary uh, left articulation between 1999 and 2003. So as I said, because of the uh, defeat of the old left, this new left uh, wouldn't emerge uh, immediately in one form, nor would it look precisely as the left had in the past. And what you saw, <coughs> rather than electoral articulations to begin with, the anomaly was Venezuela, the earliest uh, electoral expression of the left, the, the electoral victory of Chavez in late 1998 and his assumption to power in early 1999, but the real dynamic of the late 1990s is not electoral. The real dynamic of the late 1990s is the proliferation of unemployed workers' movements, formal sector workers' movements, indigenous movements, peasant occupations of land, new women's movements, new youth revolts, new revolts of students, and so on. And these dynamics and the social subjects leading them were different across different, uh, different social formations. But just to take three very briefly, if you look at Argentina, the principal actor uh, coming out of the financial crisis of 2000-2001 were, were recently unemployed workers. And it's important that they were recently unemployed because they were very much using the traditions of struggle and militant unions that they, that they were employed <laughs> in as unemployed workers to form the Picatero movement who were now involved in blocking roads and seizing, uh, re-seizing factories to repurpose them under workers' control. These were joined by downwardly mobile middle-class sectors who were increasingly radicalized because their life savings were de being depleted, because their bank, bank accounts were frozen as the value of the currency was rapidly deteriorating. They were prohibited by, by governmental decree of extracting their money and moving it abroad although capital was able to do so in a massive way. This, there's, there's, there are fewer things that can make a, rad, a, rad, a middle class join unemployed workers in the streets uh, than this dynamic. And this was what happened in 2000, 2001 uh, in Argentina. In Bolivia, where you had the strongest, um, the strongest movements of any case in, in, in all of Latin America during this period, you had a quasi-insurrectionary cycle of both a combined left indigenous struggle that began with the Cochabamba water war against the privatization of water in one city, and not even the capital city, but a middling city of Cochabamba uh, in, the, in, the, in the middle of the country. So a municipal level dispute. But that struggle, which was both urban and rural, overturned a World Bank driven privatization process by a neoliberal government and over forced the withdrawal of the concession to Bechtel, who had won, that, who had won the privatization <coughs> at municipal company. Why that's important, apart from being important for Cochabambinos, was that it was the first victory in Latin America against the right, or sorry, in, Mexi in Bolivia uh, since, since the early 1980s. There had not been a single setback for neoliberal uh, transformation in that country. That was the first contestation which then grew quickly nationally and quickly moved from water at a municipal level to contestation over what to do with natural gas, the principal source of foreign exchange in the country in the 21st century, calls for socialization and nationalization of the natural gas industry. 
These led to the so-called gas wars coming out of the water wars. These gas wars were now national in scope, although focused on the western part of the country, and capable of shutting down the entirety of the western part of the country for weeks at a time, overthrowing two neoliberal presidents in succession, and laying the basis for Evo Morales' successful uh, December 2005 election campaign, who became the first indigenous president in a country in which 62% of the population self-identified. Okay, so since the founding of the Republic in 1825, there had never been an, an indigenous president in a country with 62% of the population identifying as indigenous. So symbolically, this was a, on a scale to Mandela's election in South Africa, and import, uh, unfortunately, there are other parallels with that trajectory in terms of uh, the dynamics of, 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 of South Africa uh, uh, thereafter. In Ecuador, you saw indigenous movements which were primarily rural, um, uh, under the leadership of the Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities, the CONAE, setting the basis for the overthrow of a series of governments, making linkages with the most radical pop, uh, public sector unions in the cities, and similarly laying the basis for <coughs> Rafael Correa's victory in 2006 um, uh, electorally. So what you see is a proliferation of um, extra-parliamentary struggles of different kinds with different social subjects leading, uh, leading them, but with, a, uh, with an ability to seriously destabilize uh, the reproduction of, ne of neoliberal regimes, setting the stage for the decomposition of neoliberal parties and for the total transformation of the electoral map, moving to our fourth stage uh, between 2003 and 2011, um, uh, which is characterized uh, principally by center-left and left governments coming to office. So if in the mid-1990s, if you look at the entire map of South America, it is dominated again by right and center-right parties in the mid-1990s. By the mid-2000s, with some important exceptions, Colombia, Peru, Chile, off and on, you have a predominantly center-left and left uh, dominance in South America, a tremendous electoral shift. This comes into parts of Central America, although it really doesn't touch, uh, it doesn't touch Mexico during this period. So this is one, uh, this is one dynamic. The, the electoral expression in a muted form of that extra-parliamentary insurgency of the late 1990s, early 2000s. What is interesting, though, is that this coincides not with a period of deep recession, but with a period of renewed capitalist dynamism. And this is very important capitalist dynamism, driven by the most dynamic zone of accumulation in the world market, China's industrialization, not exclusively this, but China's the biggest actor, driving up the prices of mining minerals, natural gas and oil, agro-industrial commodities such as soya, transforming all of these industries and intensifying the extractive character of capitalism in the region, which is obviously not new, but which it takes on an accelerated form during this period. Now what this allows for center-left and left governments to do is to um, delay a series of crucial class questions or class decisions. That is to say, during the period of the commodities boom, they are able to do two things at once. They are able to introduce modest reforms to royalties and tax regimes in these extractive sectors, which they sometimes call nationalization but which in very few instances are they actually nationalization in any meaningful sense of that term. But they do involve uh, modest increases in royalties and taxes, but these modest increases have uh, an exceptional uh, theater to them because the prices of natural gas and oil are so high that even a modest increase in royalties and taxes creates a huge influx of state revenue. This allows for the, the distribution through channeled cash transfer programs through new job creation programs, through new infrastructure programs, to effectively uh, meet immediately the most pressing demands of the social base of the new left. So living standards are improving. Throughout this period, poverty is being reduced. Inequality of income, although again, if you look at wealth, there are less serious uh, restructuring. But you do see improvements in, in, in uh, inequality of income, and most importantly, uh, employment levels uh, and um, anti-poverty programs of different types, targeted anti-poverty programs, which were actually introduced under neoliberalism, 
but, but, but which were infused with much, much more capital. Okay? This is what Eduardo Godinez calls the compensatory state. It's a, it's a compensation and a relatively petty compensation for the social base when you actually look at the share that capital was taking over this period. None of the multinationals that were operating in Bolivia's natural gas and oil sector left. And there's a reason why none of them left. Because net profits over this period massively uh, uh, outdo profits over the entire 1990s. Net profits, even in Venezuela's oil sector, higher uh, during this period because of the... Uh, so two oil companies leave Venezuela, the rest stay. Um, uh, obviously not in conditions that, they would, that would, they would consider ideal, but conditions in which they were uh, uh, making higher net profits than they were in the 1990s. So you have these poverty alleviation, you have the reproduction of legitimacy of these regimes, but you have no transformation in social property relations, no transformation of these, of these countries in the international division of labor, and in fact, an intensification of their position as primary producers uh, in the international division of labor, less industrial uh, than they had been in the earlier periods. This is the material basis, uh, the fragile material basis of uh, the passive revolution uh, that Gramsci introduced. The last period, uh, the delayed reverberation of the global economic crisis. For a few years after the crisis hit in the United States, and then uh, the Eurozone, social democratic commentators who were sympathetic to, especially the center-left regimes, Kirchner in Argentina, uh, Lula in Brazil, uh, the Socialist Party or Concertacion in, in Chile, were saying that uh, because of dynamic growth rates that persisted, there was a brief dip in 2009, but aggregate growth rates in Latin America and the Caribbean persist at a high rate in 2010, 2011. During this period, there are many social democratic commentators who are saying, look, this is a way that they have regulated their way out of capitalist crisis. There is a, this is a possibility for Keynesian, uh, 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 of Keynesian um, counter-cyclical spending uh, as, a, as a resolution of these dynamics. Now this was, I, I mean, many of us thought this was naive from the beginning, but this became very clear by 2012 that Latin America, like every other region of the world, was not somehow external to the crisis. The reason for the delayed impact of the crisis in Latin America had to do with the fact that in South America in particular, the principal uh, trade patterns, um, if you look at the top exporters and importers of uh, South American nations, had shifted from the United States towards East Asia in a major way. And China, continued to take over through its own massive spending, uh, uh, a temporary solution to the crisis in, in China. So still lower rates of growth, but still very, very high growth rates on an international scale in China, allowing for the, over t the, the, the continual uptick of commodities prices of this period. But beginning in 2011, China starts to slow down. And every year since 2011, China has the lowest rate of growth since 1990 in China. And for every percentage point of GDP uh, diminution in China, you have a major impact on South American dynamism. So even from the beginning, where South America looked like it was out of the crisis, so much so that aggregate uh, growth patterns for the entire region were positive during this period, even in that period, it was not true of Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. Because Mexico and Central America and the Caribbean are much more implicated into North, into North American dynamics. So for Mexico, the crisis was immediate. For Central America, the crisis was immediate. And the mechanisms of transmission of the crisis from the U.S. were the end of their principal export market, which are still the United States for all of these subregions, not, not China. So Central America, the Caribbean, and Mexico. The end of, uh, of undocumented and documented migrant uh, remittances. And not only the end of remittances, but the return of laborers spiking up unemployment rates back at home. So if you think of El Salvador, the principal source of foreign exchange is remittances. The overwhelming source of foreign exchange in El Salvador. So not only were Salvadorans losing their jobs in the, in the earliest hit sectors of the, of the U.S. economy, but they're also temporarily at least returning home. 
And this sometimes spiked, uh, paradoxically spikes the figures on remittances because they return with all their wealth, that they, their entire wealth, but this is a one-off return, followed by years of, 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 of downturn. Sorry, uh, so I'm at the end, but I'll, I'll just wrap up uh, briefly. So uh, once China slows down, the crisis comes to, uh, comes to Latin America, South America in particular, in a, in a significant way. There is no renewal of dynamism in the United States, no renewal of dynamism in the Eurozone, allowing for some other source of potential uh, exit. And South America is therefore mired, uh, be, albeit in a delayed way, in this, in this crisis. Venezuela, of course, is uh, deeply hit by the collapse of oil prices in 2014, 150% collapse in oil prices, 96% of, uh, of the total value of exports in Venezuela is constituted by oil exports, 96%. It was 77% at the beginning of Chavez's time in office. Okay, So this was monumental. But it was also the price of soya, the price of mining minerals, all of these are collapsing. Um, Brazil enters into its, its uh, worst recession, which delays, uh, 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 which um, persists for four years. Okay? So, again, a new <coughs> recession, the worst since the late 1990s and early 2000s, but this time the center left and left are in power. And that delayed class decision that they did not make. At the, early, at the early decisive uh, period of uh, the commodities boom when these, when these uh, governments came to office was now forced upon them. In a situation of austere state revenues, who was going to pay for uh, the crisis of, of revenues? Was it going to be the social basis that persisted the reproduction of them in power? Or was it going to be uh, capital who paid for this crisis? And the decision, unfortunately, not that this was merely a technological, uh, sorry, a technocratic decision. This is obviously an expression. Also, the balance of forces and dynamics of, of struggle in the region. But what happened was center-left and left regimes, uh, almost without exception, introduced austerity packages against their own social bases. Sometimes disguised uh, in different ways, but massive reductions in social spending, massive reductions in job creation programs, coinciding with the deceleration of their economies and higher rates of unemployment. And uh, a good example of this is Dilma Rousseff's second administration, in which she signals to financial capital through the selection of a neoclassical economist trained at the University of Chicago for, their, for her new finance minister, an attempt to appease financial capital with the idea that the traditional social basis will continue to support the Workers' Party. And what happened is she lost both of these sources of support. Capital, which had learned to live with the left during periods of enormous net profits, early, early years they tried to destabilize these regimes. But after three years they learned to live with them. But they, it was never their natural home. And during a new period of crisis, declining profitability, they returned to their natural home of center-right and new-right configurations. So the Workers' Party is abandoned by capital. The Workers' Party at the same time is abandoned by their social bases. Beginning with the June 2013 major revolts against tariff increases in public transport, which started out as a left movement fundamentally, but was then captured by the right over time. Now what you have at the moment is momentum on the right in which when the right cannot win electorally, they are nonetheless seizing power. Through extra-constitutional change, such as the parliamentary coup in Brazil in 2016, which removed Rousseff uh, in an extra-constitutional form, which had already happened in 2012 under Fernando Lugo in Paraguay, and, and expressly military coups of an old style in Honduras in 2009 to remove Manuel Celaya, and electorally where possible. Argentina, they run a candidate, Mauricio Macri, the former mayor of Buenos Aires, who was actually a center-right figure, not a far-right figure, but it's basically ran on the precise, uh, not the precise, but a very, very similar package to the Peronist candidate, who was the furthest right Peronist candidate in those elections since Carlos Mann of the 1990s. So even if Peronism had won, the, the left strategy to preservation was moving to the right and running to the right, introducing austerity in an attempt to fight the right with its own package. What this has meant is persistent defeats of the left, 
Sebastian Pinera is back in office in Chile. Um, Tamer is obviously massively unpopular in Brazil, but uh, it's not at all clear who's going to win the next elections. Venezuela, the congressional elections were already, uh, uh, the, the right was victorious, and if the right participates in the next elections, uh, there's reason to believe that they will win, in my opinion. Uh, and on and on. But the problem for the right is that once they're in office, they have no solution to the crisis of capitalism that persists in Latin America, because there is no restoration of dynamism that they can appeal to outside as a restoration of export-led growth. And they do not have the capacity nor the inclination to have an inwardly looking endogenously driven state-fueled uh, 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 state recovery of growth. And so what happens when they come to office is that they're immediately met with social resistance of a, of, of a new scale. The first general strike in Brazil in 21 years. Major strikes in Argentina over this period. But at the moment, there is a huge gap between this social left that's capable of resisting defensively these new neoliberal restoration projects, and these governments are not popular, but nor is it obvious uh, that the left has any project of, uh, of immediately uh, returning, to, uh, returning to, to office. So what you have is an impasse in which the right is governing, and increasingly governing through uh, repressive, uh, decree-oriented forms of rule, uh, while remaining very unpopular. But the right is unfortunately capable of per persisting in this kind of rule uh, to a degree that the left obviously is not, in the sense that the left cannot appeal when in office to these kinds of extraordinary waves of repression that are sometimes sufficient to the reproduction of power. Thanks. So, uh, I'm going to be chairing the q and A. I'm told, so we have 25 minutes, uh, and what I'll do, if it's okay with everyone, is take a, a series of questions, if there are some, for a round, so that I don't talk too long about each individual question. So if there are any questions, please put your hand up. If you would, I'd like to hear you uh, speak to uh, Columbia. Uh, specifically your impression of the recent history and, and projection in light of the uh, election cycle coming up and why you think they've been able to avoid some of the paths that some neighboring countries have gone down. Okay. Uh, could you talk about drug policy and how that might evolve with the um, reemergence of the right? behind you. So I'm curious about um, your thoughts on corruption. Because, as opposed to other regions in the world, corruption is not a phenomenon that is taken seriously in a way in Latin America by either political science or, or sociology. Uh, so the economics literature has some explanation for the effects of corruption, about the effects of corruption, because of the structural conditions of the Latin American economies and what the extreme dependence on, on uh, natural resources and other things may do for efficiencies and efficiencies of the level of the state. Uh, but part of what explains the delegitimization of the, the left was in power for a decade is the explosion of cases of corruption to an extent that was not seen before in previous developmental eras in the, in the region. So I'm just curious about how you think about conceptually about corruption and, and not write it off as a phenomenon that, yeah, it also happens in the region. How do you think about it? Okay, the last one for this. Yeah. Something I've, I've wondered about, I'd like to get your thoughts perhaps, and that is what U.S. attention toward away from Latin America, South America, uh, specifically toward it being tied up in, in war, imperial war in the Middle East, assisted in, or was it a factor in, this, in assisting this opening? Okay, so I'll, I'll take those uh, to begin with. So to start with, um, Colombia, so Colombia was one of the obvious, who asked the Colombia? 
that's right. The um, Columbia was one of the obvious anomalies to the turn to the left. Um, it's difficult to do justice to a kind of short rehash of Colombian history, but in the recent period. But the um, the key uh, external dynamic to this is that Colombia is uh, the closest ally of the U.S. in the entire region, the recipient of the third largest um, uh, aggregate levels of aid of all kinds after only Israel and Egypt over this of this period, um, the effective police state of, of the region. Um, this was done um, under the guise of the drug war, um, but was in domestic terms an effort to uh, counter the insurgency of the FARC and the ELN, um, but also facilitated even after the diminution, the relative diminution of those funds, so the Columbia is still a very high recipient, but, but quite dramatic decrease from the, from the era of the Plan Colombia under Clinton and so on. Um, but what this allowed for, uh, even with the reduction of money, was the, was the uh, shift from state terrorization of the population to paramilitary terrorization on behalf of, of the state, in, insofar as the state allows paramilitary um, uh, decisive free reign, impunity to do what it wants to social actors. So, very hostile terrain for a left to, to emerge of any, kind of, of any electoral type. And there are many, many examples of why this was very difficult in Colombian history and why there, was, why there were then guerrilla movements in that context. Uh, the, the recent history uh, of the peace negotiations um, is, is premised on the military defeat of the, of the FARC. That's where you have to start. Uh, Oribe, uh, between 2000 and 2010, was massively successful from his vantage point of militarily routing through extraordinary campaigns of extreme violence the elimination of most of the, of, of the FARC's uh, operating bases. This was a military defeat in which they were labeled terrorists and there was no sense of, of negotiation as a political actor. Now, the transition uh, to Santos is often seen as some extraordinary departure, but if Santos was the defense minister of Uribe. This is hardly a, a massive uh, trajectory. No doubt they represent slightly different sections of capital. But the, but the peace accords now were premised on the idea of renewing easy access to uh, the intensification of extraction of oil, mining minerals, and, and agri-commodities. Um, uh, so that engineers wouldn't be kidnapped and so on in the, in the ways that they have been in recent periods. Uh, so if it was possible for peace with defeat, I mean, the, the important aspect of that was that FARC was defeated. And so the negotiations were, were premised in the same kind of asymmetrical way that Central American peace agreements were in the early 1990s, not some kind of uh, agreement between uh, relatively equal actors, but premised on, on, on decisive defeat by the right. So that's where we're at. There are some interesting uh, possibilities now of of the you know the new uh, FARC um, political party, which is basically running on a social democratic campaign. There's, there's no sense of a revolutionary uh, uh, commitment to this. It's an electoral campaign of the of the left, but there are also many interesting social movements going on. Um, but you know, assassinations and violence persist in a, in a very, very stark way, uh, far exceeding, for example, the, the violence in Venezuela that gets highly disproportionate news coverage. So, I mean, there's more to say, but those are some of the dynamics of, of Colombia. Um, on, on drugs and the, and the new right, I mean, drugs and the new right are, um, are a story for basically the what you can call this the greater Central American corridor. If we, if, we, if we stretch Central America to include Colombia, which is obviously formerly in South America, and we, we stretch it to include Mexico, which is in North America, that corridor is a corridor of, of narco-trafficking and all of the premises of, of the drug war. But it's important, I think, not to treat uh, cocaine, heroin, and other drugs as totally alien commodities, 
operating under totally different laws of accumulation than any, than any other commodity. I mean, obviously, they have distinct characteristics insofar as they're illegal. So they have inflated, uh, inflated prices and inflated ability to police turfs, market turfs, through extraordinary extra-state extra violence. But it's deeply implicated in the, let's say, legal accumulation strategies. This is also responsible for real estate sectors in Mexico, for construction sectors, for tourism sectors, for banking sectors, huge parts of the U.S. banking sector, into the city in London, HSBC has been laundering money uh, from Mexican cartels over this entire period, etc. So there, there are very blurry lines between the so-called narco economy and the regular bourgeois economy. Um, but what the narco, what the label narco does is what the label communist used to do and what the label terrorist does in the current period, in which once you flexibly label something a terrorist, communist, or narco trafficker, you can, under these extraordinary legal um, uh, flexible regimes, do whatever you want to these people. So, for example, in Mexico, there are very strong links between cartels informally hired by Canadian mining corporations to take care of activists who are um, uh, disputing uh, mining concessions in, in indigenous territories. Once those assassinations have occurred, those appear in the paper as victims of narco violence, caught in the crossfire of narco cartel activity, etc. So it's a very useful device to cover all kinds of activity that has nothing to do with the drug trade, in fact, or is only uh, peripherally to do with the immediate question of drugs. Um, uh, but yes, drugs are a major uh, part of the story, a major accumulation strategy, uh, and they operate in the same way as other global commodities to a certain extent, in the sense that most people doing the killing and dying in the drug trade are the proletarian layers of the, of the uh, narco economy. So informalization of the world of work, that is a very attractive job uh, under the conditions. Um, although, albeit with a very short lifespan uh, for people involved in it. But for young men in particular, uh, it is higher paid than other, um, than other sections of the informal economy, which is, and this reserve army of labor makes possible, uh, makes possible that industry. Um, and the concentration of value then is, is is, is in particular cartels with particular relations to the Mexican state, the Mexican military, Mexican governors, uh, and so on. Sorry, I went on a bit too long on that one. So, uh, corruption. Uh, <clears throat> so, I mean, one thing is, is interesting is to think of Gramsci's idea of corruption as a form of statecraft rather than something particularly anomalous. Um, and I, and I, I actually, I, think, I don't think it's empirically true that the left has seen unprecedented cases of corruption. Uh, in fact, I think there are many, many precedents for the recent uh, corruption uh, scandals of the Latin American left in Latin American, even in very recent Latin American history. I mean, in Brazil, that was the reason for the impeachment of the last impeachment of a neoliberal president in 1992. So it's not a new phenomenon, um, but anti-corruption campaigns in Latin America as elsewhere, uh, I mean, someone can, can correct me if they, if, if they can think of an anomaly, but every campaign against anti-corruption in which that has been the leading edge of the campaign has been, has been a campaign of the right. Uh, it's a very unsuccessful strategy of the left of campaigning around anti-corruption. Very seldom is this a is this a principal uh, claim. Um, I think what we need to do, uh, and most of the discussion around corruption, in my view, in the social scientific literature, is basically based on a fairy tale of, of the properly operating meritocratic state that Weber talked about, the bureaucratic rational state that supposedly exists in the advanced capitalist countries, and then against that, that, that norm, what is happening elsewhere in the world. And it also takes, takes on a kind of moralizing tone of, of, uh, uh, of other parts of the world. Um, 
a better way of looking at this, in my view, is to see this as a form of statecraft and as a form of particular, in the, in the, in the recent period of capitalism, a period of bureaucratization related to the accumulation of rent. So in Venezuela, what you see is um, what, it, what is called corruption is actually a key, an accumulation strategy, a part of the bureaucratic layer of the state, in which control of access to um, uh, the legal currency and bids to uh, import, import bids, the bids to distribute foodstuffs and so on, are selectively distributed by the state. The circulation of, and this existed alongside a parallel currency, which was a, which is a, uh, a black market currency in, in which the rates of exchange are entirely different. So you have an accumulation strategy in which you have access to the state to accumulate uh, access to uh, import quotas and so, and so on, in which you uh, do not actually import the goods that you say you're importing, um, uh, and you use the dollars and recycle them in the black market to accumulate in this way. The other dynamic of this in, in Venezuela is the introduction of huge parts of the military into the bureaucratic operations of the state, in which military, military factions of the military have become capitalist, uh, uh, have formed capitalist accumulation strategies within their bureaucratic positions in the state. Um, um, operating in both legal and illegal ways. And so roughly $20 billion by, by low estimates um, and, and up to $100 billion by some other estimates has gone missing in Venezuela over this period. But it has, by, by most uh, analyses, this is going into a particular identifiable layer of state bureaucrats who are also privately accumulating wealth. And this is a, that layer is who Maduro is now representing in Venezuela. And the reproduction of that layer, which is also using its ability and connections with the military to reproduce itself in the state. So I think some of that dynamism is lost if we just say this is corruption, as, as in, as in what, it, what we need is good, honest people rather than, than, than bad guys in the state. It's a, it's, a, it's a structural characteristic of the state and a reproduction of a strategy of statecraft once they're in office. In terms of U.S. imperialism, uh, which I didn't get a chance to talk about very much in the actual talk, um, uh, it's true that there was, uh, see, the question was, did U.S. overextension in the wars in the Middle East allow for relative autonomy of Latin America? Um, and I think that was true for, uh, to a certain extent in terms of the idea of the U.S. launching an actual military, another military war in Latin America was, uh, I mean, there was never any indication that this would happen. But the U.S. has only very rarely engaged in overt military war in Latin America anyway. Uh, I mean, in the, in the recent hundred years, um, there have been some exceptions. But what they have done principally is operate through uh, uh, proxy uh, wars and actors and so on uh, inside of this. And that really didn't disappear over this period. In fact, there were was consistent funding for the right in Venezuela, um, uh, consistent, um, uh, in, indeed an expansion of U.S. power in Central America, the Caribbean, and Mexico, but a reduction elsewhere in places like Colombia. But in South America, what you saw was not just the military <coughs> dynamic of the U.S. being overly overextended in the, in the Middle East, but you also saw the reduction, importantly, of economic power. So this is quite extraordinary. The World Bank and the IMF during the 1980s and 1990s in Latin America were overwhelmingly the ways in which the U.S. imperialism <coughs> operated uh, through conditionality loans and these kinds of things. Uh, the World Bank and IMF during the early 2000s had virtually no role to play in Latin America. They completely disappeared. As new lines of credit opened up through Venezuela using, using extraordinary oil rents and also new lending from China, which exceeded between 2005 and 2011 the loans from the World Bank, loans from the IMF, loans from, with separate conditionalities in the interest of Chinese state. But this, but this did relieve uh, pressures of the U.S. Um, 
uh, and in the in the Trump scenario, um, it's difficult to know precisely what what Trump is trying to trying to do. Um, but what is what is obvious is that most of the rhetoric vis-a-vis -vis Latin America um, has nothing to do with uh, what is actually going on. And in the same way that um, uh, s the same structural limitations that a social democratic president would have in this country dealing with the structural capacity of capital to uh, flex its power against the U.S. state is happening to Trump in the same way, in the sense that Trump represents no distinct section of U.S. capital, and in fact, most sections of U.S. capital uh, obviously do not want a wall between the United States and Mexico. They want a xenophobic environment. They're very happy with high levels of racism. Even the theater of deportation is important, and undocu undocumented laborers is useful uh, as a reserve army, but they can't actually have a diminution in the number of migrants. Uh, it's fundamental re reproduction of capitalism in this country. Um, so to the extent that Trump actually dreamed of this, and it's unclear what he actually dreams of, obviously, but, but to the extent that, he's, that you could trace a policy, none of this, none of this is real. Um, and most of it is a continuity. So the, the latest national security uh, program uh, released by the state is interesting to read. If you compare it to Obama's last, uh, uh, last national security uh, program. What's interesting, too, is to think about Trump's public communication of that national security doctrine, which was very different than Obama's public, public expression of it. But when you read the document, they are virtually the same. There, there's virtually no distinction between U.S. imperialism. So I'm not sure if that I was <coughs> answered your question completely, but that was my attempt. Are there any other last bits? Okay. Yeah, so... Um, most narratives of the new, of the pink tide, especially like liberal narratives, you know, emphasize the differences between um, between you know uh, you know Kurt Whelan calls the contestory left and the reformist or Castaneda the, the good and the bad left, and and in your narrative you're focusing on on the periods common to all of them, you know, or or and then elsewhere you've you've you know described like the regime in, in Bolivia, which would be squarely in the bad left is, you know, neoliberalism reconstituted. So I was just wondering if you have a favorite way of kind of broadly characterizing the variation in um, trajectories between uh, leftist regimes. Um, I'm interested in the, uh, you were talking about the Peruvian um, individual, about the indigenous um, lives, lifestyle being a socialist model or something that could would, would result in being socialist. Um, serving in the Peace Corps, in, I was in a very isolated Mopan Mayan village near the Guatemalan border in southern Belize. And this was about a fifth, the village was about 50 years old. And the people that, the villagers, um, all farmers, 900, 130 households, and there was no electricity or anything, and so it, it, it all functioned on a very level plane of wealth. I mean, all everybody had about the same income. Uh, housing was a community effort that was extracted from the rainforest, and houses were built communally. Farming was done communally without equipment. And I'm wondering, did I was I living in a uh, a socialist? Nirvana, <laughs> or was this just a total anomaly? And, and the other thing was, is that because of the colonial times that they had come into the country, they were fleeing Guatemala 50 years before from some of the genocides. They had come into British Honduras, and because it was defined as crown land, no one owned it. And that had not changed with the independence of Belize. So they were basically practicing a traditional land tenure where the sort of leadership of the tribal leadership of the clans, these, these uh, you know, divisions inside of the village, 
would decide who got land based on need. You got married, or you know things like that, and you got your milpa. Again, that's extraordinary. But is that a model that the individual you were talking about in Peru was maybe looking at through an evolution? You know, to that, it, it would have problems in an industrial sense, but still, it it worked perfectly in that. It didn't work perfectly because it had envy and everything else that we all have, but it still functioned seemingly very well. Okay. Yeah, I think there was one more. Or no? Okay. I'll, uh, I'll deal with these uh, then. Um, the, the pink tide in terms of differentiations, um, uh, I mean, I think there are, there are kind of two levels of analysis to, to do. Uh, that you have to navigate, which I try to do in the book more particularly. So there are specific chapters on Bolivia, Venezuela, Chile, which attempt to show uh, the specificities of the dynamics. Uh, that, and of course, when you look closely, there are particularities to, to each case. Um, but the purpose of the talk today was precisely to counter some of these ideas of, which are premised on this radical separation of politics from economics, in which um, for people like Kurt Weiland, who obviously um, has a deep ideological commitment to um, a, what he calls like a renovated social democracy of, of Lula uh, and so on, uh, and, is, and is even critical of them from the right in his discussion, um, for them, uh, everything has to do with the configuration of, of uh, the parties in power and the institutional arrangements that they, um, that they cleave to. That is to say, they treat the state as infinitely malleable, and therefore, when these different, when these different uh, left governments come to office, they, man they are seen to manipulate them in, in extraordinarily different ways. But when you step back and think about the dynamics of capital accumulation across the entire region, the overwhelming similarities, not just across cases of the left, but t between the left and the right, are, are quite extraordinary. So it is, not it is not just true, for example, that poverty was reduced in the left in this period. It was also reduced in Colombia. It was also reduced in Peru, which was extraordinarily right-wing regimes. This has to do with the dynamics of the... Uh, of the dynamism of the commodities boom. I mean, it would have been an historic achievement not to have reduced poverty in this circumstance, right? Um, uh, but nonetheless, I mean, of course, politically, the balance of forces uh, internally uh, has an impact on the, the determination to a certain degree of the character of the state. So in Bolivia, let's just say Bolivia and Venezuela, which are often, I think, treated as very, very similar but I think are, are, are quite radically distinct in, in, in other ways. Uh, in Bolivia, the key dynamic was a totally unprecedented and unparalleled in the region uh, left indigenous quasi-insurrectionary cycle. So the breadth of organization from below, the, the depth of a rejuvenation of very long-standing left and indigenous radical traditions uh, meant um, that from below, the capacity to, de to destabilize the reproduction of neoliberalism was extraordinary. Once Evo Morales comes to office, and obviously this is a contentious debate, but my position is that what, what Morales represented was um, the capture of that momentum and its redirection uh, to other means. So the decapitation and bureaucratization of for example, independent trade unions, independent peasant associations, and so on, by selectively incorporating them into state apparatuses. At the same time, especially by the second administration, the alliances were clear with the agro-industrial capitalists of the lowland soya producers, multinational natural gas companies, and multinational mining capital. Those were the bases of power, together with petty bourgeois uh, indigenous accumulation strategies of a low scale, so cooperative mining, uh, illegal uh, trade in, um, in clothing, in El Alto, uh, extraordinarily labor-intensive, small-scale capital reproduction that was protected, which is primarily indigenous, but not indigenous workers and not indigenous landless peasants who were left out 
to dry. Okay? Um, so you see an extraordinary movement from below, which is then contained uh, and redirected in a classical form of transformismo uh, in the Gramscian sense. In Venezuela, it was quite the opposite. The official story of Bolivarianism in Venezuela is that you trace it back to the 1989 Caracaso, the riots against uh, the initiation of neoliberal restructuring, and then uh, momentum builds throughout the 1990s against neoliberalism and the decaying uh, political order of the post-1958 Pact of Democracy, and then Chavez represents the, uh, the uh, climax of that cycle of revolt. But in fact, Venezuela, um, because it's a uh, principally an oil frontier capitalist economy, and because of other dynamics over the 20th century, had no tradition of the left comparable to Bolivia. No, no, no radical left of any remotely comparable strength. There were small guerrilla movements which were radically uh, um, uh, repressed and marginalized. There were various heroic attempts, but no one who's serious about Venezuela and who knows Bolivia would, would compare them in these ways. Um, and the Caracaso represented this, this weakness. The Caracaso was a spontaneous rebellion. It was a rebellion, and it did have an effect on neoliberalism, but it also had very little residual impact in sustaining forms of organization. Um, so it did not kick off a cycle of revolt. And the fact that Chavez's first uh, entry into the national consciousness of Venezuela was through a coup attempt was precisely an expression of his attempt to substitute for the absence of this social base. That coup attempt, however, in 92, was indeed very popular. But what that meant was that there was a popular sentiment in opposition to neoliberalism. But this was a relatively unorganized sentiment. And once Chavez is granted amnesty, he, he pulls together a loose coalition of assorted, uh, assorted factions and runs in his first ticket, not on a socialist platform, but on a platform of uh, moderate neo-structuralist economics of the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, explicitly citing Osvaldo Sunco, the principal economist of this, of this institution. It was the, but once in office, so what I'm saying is, Chavez was the expression of the absence of a, of a social left, not the expression of a organized dynamic left. But ironically, the positions go the opposite way once in power than in Bolivia. In Venezuela, you have very modest reforms in the first years, 1999 to 2001, but those modest reforms are, are tackled ferociously by the right, with a coup attempt in April 2002, an oil lockout in 2002, 2004, and it was from the whip of that right-wing response to moderate reform that a movement from below is unleashed for the first time since 1989 in Venezuela. First, the movement to restore Chavez to power in the, in the context of that coup, but then to move far beyond Chavez's aims at that point, pushing Chavez much further than he otherwise would have gone, uh, would have gone toward, which is why the slogan emerges that when Chavez for the first time announces that he's socialist in 2005 at the World Social Forum in Porto Alegre in Brazil, that was a product of the radicalization of Chavez from below, not some kind of trajectory traceable to 1990, 1989, nor, nor easily traceable even to Chavez's electoral campaign. You have a period then of the most dramatic and uh, effervescent period of the Bolivarian process between 2002 and roughly 2005. And then you get a new period of bureaucratization through the top-town formation of the United Socialist Party of Venezuela. Now, I think a United Socialist Party was necessary, but this wasn't an organic expression of a mass movement from below. It instantaneously had five to seven million members. Now, this sounds dramatic, but it also means that these membership means nothing in this party, nor was it democratically determined, uh, and it became increasingly less so. And the bureaucratization of Chavez really begins around 2005 to 2007. Um, and with the oil crisis, Maduro takes a trajectory of, of further bureaucratization, further alliances uh, around this military layer, such that 50% of his cabinet is now in the military, 50% of governors are now uh, military officials or former military officials, um, and the bureaucratization of Venezuelan state. Now, you could take any two comparisons and 
and flesh out these dynamics. Um, um, but they very rarely fall on the lines, at least in my conception, of, of a good left, bad left, and nor are they, uh, nor are they, are some of these states, in terms of the political economy, uh, entirely distinguishable from political economies of the right in the region at the same time. So the dynamics of the world market have to be understood in some serious way. I'll just finish on the on the question of uh, indigenous communal dynamics. Okay, so there. Are, I'm very careful not to romanticize the situation in, in the book. And the return to Mariatigi is not a return of some kind of mechanistic return to Mariatigi. Mariatigi was writing in the 1920s and 1930s in Peru. And obviously the 1920s and 1930s is not the condition of today's situation. And there is no indigenous community anywhere in Latin America which is somehow outside of, uh, uh, outside of the imperatives of capital. That is to say, there is class stratification increasingly introduced, uh, market relations, uh, and so on. But there are degrees to this, and there are residual communal property rights, and there are uh, residual uh, traditional dynamics of organizational rule. So in, in Bolivia, um, and in today in Bolivia, I don't know when you were in Guatemala, but in today in Bolivia, um, it's much more advanced than it is in Guatemala. The tradition of the IU persists despite these distortions of the market in the sense of rotational leadership for, for associational positions which are based on which plots of land you have, not on the basis of, uh, of elections or anything else. Um, uh, and there are extreme limits on the privatization of property in, in so far as sections of Bolivia continue to be ruled under the IU regulations in which you don't have the option to privately sell off your grid. So there are family plots, but they're not privately owned. Okay, so you cannot sell them and try to have strategies of private accumulation in that sense. Um, so, in, in Guatemala, this, this, these ideas of, in, of indigenous traditions, I think, are, I mean, Grandin's book, The Last Colonial Massacre, Greg Grandin is extraordinarily good on this question in terms of the relationship between Maya indigenous populations and the various expressions of, of Marxism in Guatemalan history in which he traces the ways in which indigenous uh, people appropriated Marxism as, as an emancipatory project um, uh, during the guerrilla struggle. So they weren't, as is often depicted, uh, innocent, naive victims caught in the crossfire of two evils, which is the sort of David Stoll story of Guatemala. Um, it's a, they were aligned in many ways with the liberation project that was the restoration of their land. That was the idea. Um, but it was very indigenized Marxism. This wasn't simply an orthodox Marxism. Uh, it was also uh, uh, an eclectic uh, combination. But the ferocious military response to Guatemala means that today there is very little of this connection between indigenous politics and the politics of the left. Um, so Mayan politics today in Guatemala, some of it is being repoliticized around anti-mining campaigns, but most of it has been captured by a legalistic um, and tokenistic cultural politics of a layer of the Mayan elite, in which um, certain uh, indigenous expressions are encoded in the constitution, but with no material basis in the protection of communal lands, the, and when, when there are disputes between mining capital and indigenous communal lands, mining capital wins. So I went over time. That, that's, that's it.